Before I get into the keys to victory for Tyson Fury, I just want to clear up a couple of points from part one. Some people seem to have got the impression that I think Dylan White should stay on the outside and box Tyson Fury from long range. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that White should adopt similar tactics to what we saw in the Hellenius fight, where rather than just rushing his way in or bobbing and weaving his way in, he actually jabbed his way in. He hasn't developed the pressure fighting technique necessary to just rush his way in. If he tries that, Tyson Fury will walk him onto shots. But Dylan White does have a good jab, so he should utilize that. Establish his jab at long range and use that to push Tyson Fury back towards the ropes where he can start getting his power shots off. Just like Frank Bruno and Ray Mercer did against Lennox Lewis, for example. Both shorter than Lewis but they use their jabs at long range very effectively to drive Lewis back and set up power shots up close, particularly Ray Mercer. The jab is the only punch I think Dylan White should use at long range against Tyson Fury. Just the jab. As I said in part one, he needs to avoid throwing his power shots from too far out. Also, one thing I forgot to mention in part one is that Dylan White needs to make every engagement count, something which he didn't do against Robert Hellenius. When he managed to back Hellenius to the ropes, he was too slow with his power shots. He weren't getting his punches off quickly enough. He also wasn't positioning his feet correctly, so Hellenius was able to consistently spin off the ropes and remain relatively unscathed. Anyway, on to the keys to victory for Tyson Fury. Now, much like Dylan White, I think that Tyson Fury should come in light. Being taller and rangier than your opponent is only an advantage if you can keep him at the end of your punches. The heavier you are, the slower your feet will be, and the easier your opponent will find it to get in close and pin you down. And once he's inside, your longer arms will actually be a disadvantage. So I think Fury should come in nice and light. Fury should avoid exchanging too early. He should take a round or two to have a look at Dylan White, figure out what he's trying to do, then build his offense gradually. Like Errol Spence in the Ugas fight, for example. Ugas is primarily a counter puncher, so he's happy to let you enter the pocket and lead off. He'll just stand there and block your shots with his guard. The danger is when you stop punching or when you're trying to exit the pocket, that's when the counter right hand comes. So Spence used the first couple rounds to figure out the trajectory of Ugas's counters and therefore which angle he could use to exit the pocket and avoid being caught. Once he figured that out, he started engaging in these raids where he would come in, hit Ugas a few times, particularly to the body, then exit the pocket at a predetermined angle. Gradually, the body shot started to weaken Ugas and slow him down. And this allowed Spence to stay in the pocket longer and longer each time until eventually he was able to remain in the pocket permanently and start working Ugas over. Now, I'm not saying that Tyson Fury should employ the exact same tactics that Spence did against Ugas, but the same basic principle applies. You're in there with a strong guy who lacks the counter punch. So don't be in a rush to exchange with him. You're taller, you're rangier, you're the house fighter. So you've got the luxury of taking your time and forcing Dylan White to expend all his energy trying to get close to you, then walking him onto shots and breaking him down gradually. If he's sufficiently weakened in the later rounds, then maybe you can start to bully him on the inside and push him back. But don't be in a rush. Tyson Fury should use a lot of feints in this fight. Now, this is something that he typically does anyway, but it's particularly important here because Dylan White likes to counter with the left hook. So Fury should be trying to trigger that left hook with feints so he can make White miss and make him pay. Counterpunch the counterpuncher, basically. With that being said, there's no guarantee that White will actually go for the feints. It's often the case with guys like Dylan White who like to catch and shoot, meaning they like to actually block your punch before they throw their counter. Sometimes these guys are so conditioned to feeling your glove hit their guard that they won't actually go for the feints. Unless you actually hit them, then their counter won't be triggered. But this is a very big fight with a lot at stake. And in these circumstances, White could potentially be trigger happy. It's kind of like a sprinter in the 100 meter final at the Olympics. He might be so keyed up that he actually jumps the gun and produces a full stop. White tends to swing very hard with his left hook as well. And he's had well-documented issues with his shoulder. So if you can use feints to make him miss enough times, there's always the potential that he could 
throw his shoulder out again. And feints aren't just used to trigger your opponent's offense, of course. They can also be used to trigger your opponent's defense, to confuse him as to where the next punch is coming from, to keep him in his shell, so to speak. Tyson Fury needs to maintain range. We all know he can fight inside, but again, he's the taller, rangier man, so why give White unnecessary opportunities? Tyson Fury needs to be defensively aware in this fight. He sometimes likes to fight with his hands low, and he might be able to get away with that at long range against Dylan White, but at mid and close range, it could be dangerous. Earlier on in Fury's career, he was dropped by Nevin Pikage and Steve Cunningham with virtually identical punches in virtually identical circumstances. Fury had his hands low, and he was standing straight up, bearing down on a shorter opponent at too close a distance. The opponent dipped their head low and caught Fury with a big looping right hand over the top. Dylan White has been known to throw a very similar right hand on occasion. It's not usually very accurate, but there's always a first time, right? And bear in mind that Oliver McCall, who was a fairly rudimentary fighter, trained for an entire camp to land one specific punch against Lennox Lewis, who was a much more skilled and talented fighter. Because Manny Stewart, who was training McCall at the time, noticed that Lewis telegraphed his right hand. Therefore, their strategy was to beat Lewis to the punch. So he had McCall throw the same shot over and over again in sparring, beating his sparring partners to the punch with the right hand. And it ended up working perfectly in the fight. So Tyson Fury mustn't allow something similar to happen to him. He must stay defensively aware. If you're in mid-range, get those hands up and try not to square up as well because he was caught a bit square by Pikeage and Cunningham. Fury needs to extend his right hand fully, if possible, in this fight. He often throws bent arm shots. I don't know whether he struggles to extend his right arm fully due to some physical reason, or it's just a bad habit. Either way, if he's landing a bent arm right hand, it probably means he's close enough to get countered by Dylan White's left hook. So if he's leading off with the right hand, he needs to extend it fully to maintain maximum distance between himself and his opponent. Tyson Fury needs to keep this fight in the middle of the ring as much as possible. Stay off the ropes and out of the corners. We know that he can fight off the ropes and in the corners, but again, why give White opportunities that you don't need to give him? The cut he suffered against Otto Wallin actually occurred when Fury allowed himself to be backed into a corner. Wallin then threw a left hand to Fury's body and came right back upstairs with the same hand and hit Fury in the eye which caused that nasty cut. And White is clever enough to do stuff like that. So don't give him those opportunities. Keep the fight in the middle of the ring and keep White turning. White does struggle with his balance at times. So if you can force him to turn and have to move his feet more than he wants to, then you can reduce his ability to set himself quickly and generate power. Fury needs to tie Dylan White up on the inside. This isn't just to stop him punching, but it also serves to frustrate him and tire him out. He could also talk to him in those clinches and taunt him, which can amplify the effect. And finally, if Tyson Fury finds himself having issues with Dylan White's jab, he should turn southpaw. Most orthodox fighters struggle to land their jabs against southpaws because the lead hands clash, so they become almost exclusively reliant on landing a straight right hand down the pipe. I'm not sure if Dylan White has the balance or the foot speed necessary to land straight right hands against Tyson Fury at long range. The jab, yes, but straight right hands from distance? I don't think so. So if Fury can take White's jab away by turning southpaw, I think White's gonna struggle. Having said that, the southpaw advantage only exists if you manage to fight side on and keep the fight long. If you square up or allow your opponent to get too close, the advantage is lost. Anyway, that concludes my keys to victory for Tyson Fury and Dylan White. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know your views in the comments below.